Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Sonics today with Drew Wingard, who's going to talk about ways to actually apply energy savings into designs. We're looking at a lot more high-definition data coming into the, the world these days. That's a lot of, of uh, bits that have to be processed, and it also takes a fair amount of energy. How do we improve that? Well, so you know, the latest standards that are commonly available are the ultra-high-definition or 4K video standards. Um, and it is the case that today many SOCs are built with the ability to process 4K video, even though it's pretty rare that they're actually fed 4K video. So you know, we have this, this interesting phenomena that for specs purposes and for an occasional use model, you want to be able to run at this very high resolution, but most of the data that actually goes through is at a lower resolution. Um, I'd like to, show, to demonstrate a bit today about how we can deploy EPU technology to save energy even at that highest rate and of course much much more energy when we're lower. So first I think we'd talk a little bit about what you know video. So if we imagine your your average uh, video frame buffer um, a 4k video screen has 2160 lines uh, per frame. And the, you know, typically we run at 60 hertz, so the amount of time in a cycle would be 60, at 60 hertz would be 16.6 .6 milliseconds, basically. Okay. Um, even though we don't, aren't driving CRTs anymore, the broadcast standards still have a vertical blanking interval in them, as if we had a vertical retrace still to do, wait for the CRT gun to get there. And so for this, um, for at this rate, we're at about 161 microseconds for the vertical blanking interval. So when you think about opportunities to save power, well, you know, that's an interesting chunk of time where you might want to, you know, try to take advantage of it and, and maybe shut things down. And, and it's a big enough window of time. It's actually quite easy for an EPU to harvest the amount of time. But the challenge is it's only idle for 161 microseconds every 16 milliseconds, that's about 1% of the time. So even if you re re reduce the power to zero for that window of time, you're only saving 1%. So a lot of people wouldn't go after that. What we think is more interesting to do is going to look at this extra time here at the end of every row, which is the horizontal blanking interval. Okay, so if we go look at the length of one of these lines in time, it's 7.6 microseconds. And of that, 1.7 microseconds, or two, but 1.7 microseconds is the horizontal blanking interval. Well, you know, so as a ratio, that's a little bit more than 20% of the time, right? Well, so that starts off to look like something. Well, gosh, if I could save all of the power during that window of time, maybe I could save 20% of the power. And so we started looking at this. Um, and we started looking at some blocks that actually do this kind of video processing. We found some interesting things. First of all, when we, when we describe a video pipeline, we typically think of it as, you know, one stage feeds another stage, you know, feeds a third stage. But video has this characteristic that not only is the data rate high, the size of the frames is large, it's megabytes for one frame of video. And so um, because of the differences in processing rates between you know, stage one, stage two, and stage three in this pipeline, we find that people don't, aren't willing to build an SRAM to allow this pipeline to proceed in this fashion. Actually what happens is that the stage one would normally connect to stage two through DRAM. And stage two would connect to stage three through DRAM. The buffer that stores the field in between frame one and frame two is down here in DRAM. If I look at the structure of block two here, I would find it's almost always partitioned into three pieces. There's an input block that has basically a DMA engine whose job it is is to go out and fetch from DRAM the data I need. 
there's a processing block that takes the results that come from that and, and are stored in some kind of a FIFO, processes them, puts them into a FIFO, and then the third part is there's an output block whose job it is is to store that data back into the DRAM. And if we look at the actual processing or active times of these different pieces, what we find is the input block is busy for a chunk of time and then idle for quite a long time. The processing block starts working after he gets some of the data back and he's idle for some time and then the output block fires up as samples are being produced, dumps them to memory. And if we look at the length of the idle moments here, we find that they're quite a lot larger than that 1.7 microseconds that we thought was going to be the idle time at the end of every row. Well, so if we can partition this design into these three pieces, and put a separate EPU-based power controller for each one of these grains of logic, we can do some pretty interesting things. Once this guy gets to his idle moment, we can shut him down. When this guy's in his idle moment, we can shut him down. When this guy's in his idle moment, we shut him down. And it turns out that for this example, instead of having an idle time that looked like 1.7 microseconds per, per line, it effectively increased, on a weighted average basis, the, the idle time to a little bit more than four microseconds out of this 7.6 window. Now, there's a little bit of overhead to the amount of time it takes to do the power transitions inside an EPU, even as fast as it is, because we're talking about you know, only a couple microseconds worth of time. But what we found in a block like this that is that in many cases we could easily harvest between 30 and 40 percent of the power would go away. That's a pretty big number um, for a block that's running at its maximum rate. Of course, if I was running standard definition video or normal HD video, that number would go you know, up quite a lot. To some extent, what you're doing is almost micro-architecting power that goes through a system, right? So I, the, the architecture gets the big pieces, and now what you're doing is breaking it down on how to use it efficiently. Yes, absolutely. So, so, and I think that that's where I, I like this analogy of the yin and yang. If the if the if the designers have been focused on the functional part of trying to get things done at the at the maximum rates, the EPU's job is to try to take advantage of those times when they're not running at their maximum rates to try to you know pull as much power out of the system as we can. Now, to do this, we have to be really really fast. We're talking about you know turning the you know power gating blocks in you know, windows of time that are only a couple microseconds long. And so we got to be able to do this really quickly. We also have to be able to do a lot of these. If I imagine a whole pipeline, you know, I have three controllers just for this one block, but blocks one and two and three and, and four and five, if they exist, all have it. I may have 15 you know, grain controllers firing at the same time and doing this. And so you know, we use this metric of um, mega millions of power switches per second, or MSPS. For, for this example here, running this video, if you, if you start to figure out how many lines there are per second and the fact that I'm doing you know, uh, three round trips for each one, we end up with a rating for this of, of about 4.7 million power switches per second, um, which is you know, quite a large number for one block on a chip. And so if you're doing this in a basic um, IoT Edge device, that saves you some time. But if you're doing this in a very complex type of uh, chip such as a, a smartphone chip for example mm -hmm. SOC where they've got all the other factors coming in this is one more key piece of what goes into it in addition to everything else so your battery savings could be even more right oh absolutely and, and again so, so you know for one block we're at you know five you know million switches per second um, one of the interesting things about like a, a smartphone application processor is it's very modal there's very very different use cases and you and you treat the hardware inside the application processor very differently based upon that use case. Um, so I could easily imagine that I would 
have an EPU for a smartphone that might have a peak capacity over of well over 100, 150 million switches per second. Now, am I ever, am I ever achieving that value? No, probably not, because these blocks are are off and they're not they're not switching. Um, so, but but this other chain is is switching, and I could easily regularly be hitting numbers in the 50s. I think of millions of switches per second, um, right. and then the EPU isn't just about clock gating, it's not just about power gating, it's also about controlling things like dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. And so um, the interface between the operating system and the EPU is very, very important because the operating system today has a, a good view of what is the activity level of the host processor complex. And as a result of that, what's the desired operating frequency to deliver that throughput? And as a result of that, what's the optimum voltage to run at? You know, the EPU plugs into those power tables that the OS has created. So when the power, when the OS says, you know, go to this operating point, it's the EPU who's going to execute that as an instruction to go, you know, control the processor hardware to to bring the voltage down and frequency down in a safe manner. We can also um, take that same technology and apply it to some of the other building blocks in an SOC that typically don't have OS support. You know, the GPU may have OS support, but uh, um, an image signaling processor typically has no OS support for, for techniques like DVFS. We can add that using an EPU. So now when you get done watching a high def video on your phone, you still may have enough power to call somebody and say you're going to be late for a meeting. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely.